At this point in the course, we kind of flipped the switch. We've been doing a whole lot of work with derivatives. Now we flip things over and do integrals. So this first section is kind of short. I'll show you how to do some of these double integrals. I guess I could have done the first two sections together, but I'm going to split them all up into separate videos, I think. So these are double integrals over rectangular regions. And I will let you read through the PowerPoint, and you can see the whole story as to how these things are formed and what it is you're actually doing when you find these double integrals. The region on the bottom of the surface that you're trying to evaluate makes a big difference into how easy or how difficult these regions are to integrate. The rectangular regions are the easiest of them. And so we'll explore those first, and then we'll get into more complicated ones. We'll use other forms. We'll work on polars and spherical coordinates and so forth. So what the double integral does is it gives you the net volume, right? Area under a curve in two dimensions gives you the net area under a curve. In double integrals, it gives you the net volume of the solid. So everything above the z-axis is positive. Everything below the z-axis is negative. If the function is positive or zero on the entire region, then what you're actually finding is you're finding the volume of the solid. If it dips both above and below, then you're finding the net volume, where it considers everything above the z equals zero plane positive and everything below negative. So how do you do these double integrals? Okay, this is the first example. It's a 3x squared plus 4y to the third. And you notice the order dy dx. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to integrate first with respect to y using that 0 and 1 as y limits of integration. And then you're going to flip it around and do it with respect to x using the 1 and the 2 as your x limits of integration. Now when you do this, you're going to want to treat the y as your variable of integration everything else gets treated as a constant. So when you integrate a constant with respect to y, you just tack on a y next to it. All right, so let's try this first one. The first one, I'll integrate first from 0 to 1 with respect to y. So remember I said that when you integrate with respect to y and you integrate a constant, it just tacks on a y. So you'll end up with a 3x squared y. And then when you integrate 4y to the third, you'll get 4y to the fourth over 4, which is just y to the fourth. Now, the trick is you can only put the values of 1 and 0 in for y. So sometimes I like to throw that extra letter in there and say I'm going to evaluate this at y equals 0 and at y equals 1. So if I evaluate this at y equals 1, I get 3x squared plus 1. If I evaluate it at y equals 0, I get just 0, right? So my answer for the first part is 3x squared plus 1. But wait, there's more. Now I've got to integrate 3x squared plus 1 from 1 to 2 with respect to x. All right, when I take the antiderivative, I'll get 3x to the third over 3, which is just x to the third. Don't forget when you integrate a 1, you get an x. You've been thinking about derivatives for the last couple of weeks. Now you're thinking integrals. All right, I'm just going to put the 2 and the 1 there because that's the only variable that I have in the problem. So 2 to the third is 8. So I got an 8 plus 2 minus 1 plus 1 just gives me 8. Okay, so the net volume under that surface is 8. All right, take a look at the second one. The second one says we're going to do the double integral, except this time it's dx dy. So now integrate that first thing with respect to x. What do I get? 3x to the third over 3 is just x to the third plus... 4xy to the third, and this time I'm evaluating it at x equals 2 and x equals 1. You notice that when we switched the dx dy order over here, we also switched the limits of integration over there. All right, so 2 to the third is 8. 4 times 2 is 8y to the third. And then I'm going to subtract the integral evaluated at 1, so x equals 1, and then 4 times 1 times y to the third. 4y to the third. Let's simplify this. This gives me 8 plus 8y to the third minus 1 minus 4y to the third. So I get 4y to the third plus 7. All right. Now integrate that. I know I'm squeezing the answer in here. So I'm going to integrate 4y to the third plus 7, this time from 0 to 1 with respect to y. So now those dx's and dy's is sometimes you got lazy in calc 1 or calc 2 and didn't put them there. Now all of a sudden they become important. So take the antiderivative of this. You'll end up with 4y to the 4th over 4, which is y to the 4th, 
plus 7y evaluated at 1 and at 0, I get 1 plus 7 minus 0 is 8. I get the same answer. Turns out that's usually the case. If you switch the x's and y's and also switch the limits of integration, it doesn't matter which order you do them in, you'll get the same answer. Sometimes it's actually helpful to switch the order of operation or order of integration because it makes things easier or in some cases it makes things possible. So let's take a look at this one. Ooh, I got an x cosine xy and I'm integrating dy dx. All right, so this says to start with the dy first and then integrate with respect to x. So when I do that, remember the x is just a constant, so I start with an x. Integrate cosine and I get sine, but don't forget there's a chain rule involved in here. So I get the sine of xy divided by the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the inside with respect to y is x. And how about that? The x's go away. So this will give me the sine of xy evaluated at y equals 1 and at y equals 0. So this will give me the sine of x minus the sine of 0, which is the sine of x. Now in my next step, the outside limits of integration are 0 and pi over 2. So I integrate from 0 to pi over 2 of the sine of x with respect to x. Well, that will give me negative cosine x evaluated at pi over 2 and at 0. So just watch your negative signs. Negative cosine pi over 2 minus a negative cosine of 0. So this will give me a 0. No, I'm not writing negative 0. 0 plus 1 equals 1. And that's my answer. All right, so don't forget the chain rule when you do these things, and don't forget the chain rule with respect to the variable that you want. All right, the area, the problems we've been doing so far are really called iterated integrals, meaning that I split them up and I have specific limits of integration for each of those variables, so we call those iterated integrals. Sometimes they're not given to us as iterated integrals, and we've got to make up our own. So I've got this surface, which is given by x squared plus xy. I'm integrating with respect to the area, right? That's what that DA means. Doesn't mean district attorney. It means integrate it with respect to the area. The area is this rectangle here that goes from x equals 1 to x equals 2 and from y equals negative 1 to y equals positive 1. So this thing here is the base of my object, and then this determines its surface above. So when I set this up as an iterated integral, I could do it in either order. I don't know. I'll do it dx dy. If I do it dx dy, so x squared plus xy dx dy, the x limits of integration go from 1 to 2. The y limits of integration go from negative 1 to 1. Right? So take the antiderivative first with respect to x. So you'll get x to the third over 3 plus x squared over 2 times y. And we're evaluating this at x equals 2 and x equals 1. So that'll give me an 8 thirds plus 4y over 2 is just 2y. And then minus 1 third plus 1y over 2. All right, does this clean up nicely? I get a 7 thirds plus 2 and a half y. Well, 2 and a half y is 5 halves y. All right, let's come over here, and now we're going to integrate the outside piece. So negative 1 to 1 of 7 thirds plus 5 halves y. Integrate it with respect to y. Oops, hang on a second. That thing in there should be a negative. So that 5 halves is actually a 3 halves, because I should have subtracted, not added. Here, I'll put my mistakes in green so you know that they're there. <laughs> All right, so that 5 over there should be a 3. All right, now take the antiderivative with respect to y. So I get 7 thirds y plus 3y squared over 4, because there already was a 2 there, and now I'm adding another 2. So now I substitute, I get a 7 thirds plus 3 fourths, and then minus 
7 times negative 1 is negative 7. So I should get a negative 7 thirds here. But I keep the positive 3 fourths because negative 1 squared is positive 1. All right, so 7 thirds minus a negative 7 thirds is 14 thirds. And the 3 quarters actually goes away, right? 3 fourths minus 3 fourths is 0. So there's my answer. Double integral over that rectangular region gives me a net volume of that. All right, when does order make a difference? So in this case, I've got another cosine function like I had in the previous example. Actually, it looks pretty similar to it. This time, my rectangular region has the y's going from 0 to pi over 3, and the x is going from 0 to 1. Well, what if I were to integrate this with respect to y first? I could do that, right? I could integrate that function with respect to y, but then how would I do it? I would end up needing integration by parts. Is it impossible? No, no, it's not impossible at all, but um, you try it first. I'm instead going to integrate with respect to x first because you realize my little trick is if I derive the inside piece with respect to x, then I'm only going to then I'm going to be able to divide it through by y because y is that constant and I'll knock out the y that's in front of it. So to avoid integration by parts, I'm going to switch the order so that I do the integration first with respect to x. So here, let's come over to the side here, and I'm going to write my integral this way. If I'm going to integrate first with respect to x, I'll put the x limits of integration first, y cosine xy dx, and then I'll put the y limits of integration, which are 0 to pi over 3. All right, so first we integrate this with respect to x, and that gives me y integrate cosine, I get sine xy divided by the derivative of the inside with respect to x. So the derivative of the inside with respect to x is just y, and it's magic. I end up with the sine of xy evaluated at x equals 1, although it really doesn't matter, x equals 1 and x equals 0. Yeah, I guess it does matter. So I end up with the sine of y minus the sine of 0. And now this becomes a whole lot easier problem than trying to integrate by parts. So 0 to pi over 3 sine of y with respect to y gives me a negative cosine y, negative cosy, evaluated at pi over 3 and at 0. So negative cosine of pi over 3 minus a negative cosine of 0. Ooh, go back to unit circles. Cosine of pi over 3 is a half. So I get a negative 1 half plus 1, which is a half. All right, let's take a look at one more. If you're trying to find average value of a function, remember in Calc 1 you had the mean value theorem, so you did the average value of the function as the integral divided by the length along the x-axis? Well, here it's going to be the same idea. You're going to do the double integral and then divide by, in this case, not the length, because now we're in two dimensions. You're going to divide by the area of the region that you're integrating over. So take a look at this guy here. Average value of sine x sine y over the region where the x's go from 0 to pi and the y's go from 0 to pi. So it's a nice square on the bottom. First thing you might do is find the area of that region, right? The y's go from 0 to pi. The x's go from 0 to pi. So the area of that region is pi squared. Now, let's set up the integral. The integral is sine x sine y. So let's do the double integral. Sine x sine y. I don't know that there's an advantage to doing one over the other, so I'll do it dy dx. We keep doing dx dy. Let's do this one dy dx. Limits of integration are actually the same. 0 to pi, 0 to pi. If you're going to integrate with respect to y, then sine of x is just a constant, as funny as it seems. So you'll end up with the sine of x times the integral of the sine of y. The sine of y, the antiderivative, will give you negative cosine y. And you're going to evaluate that at y equals pi and at y equals 0. So that gives me negative, I'll put the negative on the outside, negative sine x cosine pi minus a negative sine x cosine 0. 
Well, the cosine of pi is negative 1, so negative 1 times negative 1 will just give me a sine of x. Over here, the cosine of 0 is 1, so I get another sine of x. That gives me 2, 2 sine x's. Okay, now let's do the second part. Now let's integrate from 0 to pi of 2 times the sine of x with respect to x. So that will give me negative 2 cosine of x evaluated at pi and at 0. So I get negative 2 cosine of pi minus a negative 2 cosine of 0. So negative 2 times negative 1 plus 2 times 1, 2 plus 2 is 4. So that gives me the value of the integral, but the question asks for the average value of the function. So now if I want the average value of the function, all I have to do is take 4 divided by the area of the region, and I'm done. So that's the average value. Right? No different than doing the integrals and then dividing by the length in Calc 1. Here you do the integral and divide it by the area of the base. That's it for this section.